Welcome, everybody. I am Joe Anasco from the UNH Education Department, and the very first thing I want to do is acknowledge the civic engagement that uh, I see on full display here. We've got a fairly packed crowd of over 100 participants, despite a very lousy spring, uh, at least in my estimation, and yet some beautiful weather out there today, and, and yet you've, uh, you've uh, agreed to participate, and um, I like your value decision. Uh, and as well, in the spirit of uh, civic engagement and community engagement, I'd like you to take a moment and uh, introduce yourselves to your neighbors to your left and right. And if you do that for a moment. See ya. I know, and it's still cold out. Yeah. Thanks so much for that, and uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsor, uh, my very own UNH Education Department and as well the New Hampshire Institute for Politics and uh, Public Library here at St. Anselm College and its director, uh, Neil Levesque. Uh, there he is over there. Um, for hosting our first constitutionally speaking workshop for K-12 teachers. And we'd not be here today without the indefatigable efforts of Susan Leahy, an attorney for the McLean Law Firm and member of the New Hampshire Supreme Court Society, who's made this initiative a reality. Where is Susan? Susan, in the back row. And of course, uh, as well, Susan's uh, very good and longtime friend, uh, Supreme Court, retired Supreme Court Justice David Souter, who returned to the Granite State uh, with a vision of making New Hampshire's K-12 civic education program the best in the nation. Our program events for educators are gonna be called Constitutionally Speaking. However, our organization is the New Hampshire Institute for Civic Education and involves a collaborative effort of the New Hampshire Supreme Court Society, the New Hampshire Humanities Council, and the new uh, UNH School of Law. So why the need for a civics institute? Aside from the maddening realities of our current politics, the rationale can be summed up with the following two quotes. First, I'll start with Harvard political professor Michael Sandel, quote, good citizens are made, not found. And second, the great John Dewey, Democracy has to be born anew every generation, and education is its midwife. That makes you midwives, by the way. <laughs> With this in mind, let me briefly summarize the Institute's K-12 goals going forward. First and foremost, we hope to increase voter participation, and especially among the non-college bound in New Hampshire, a group that is much less likely to participate in the political process. This work will involve teaching students how to vote, but more importantly, it involves cultivating political awareness and civic virtues found in lifelong voters. Second, we will provide New Hampshire teachers with professional development opportunities and resources to enhance their civic knowledge, to share and develop best practices in the classroom, including how to lead effective and balanced discussions of public issues, and to share and develop best practices for civic engagement beyond the classroom, including community service work and political action. One of our more intensive opportunities will occur in the summer of 2014 when we offer two one-week summer institutes one for elementary teachers and the other for secondary social studies teachers. Third, 
we hope to implement a statewide civics portfolio requirement starting in kindergarten and continuing through grade 12. And I would argue a much more authentic form of assessment than uh, our current direction. Which leads us to the fact that our national education reform has seriously marginalized the social studies and civic education under No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top. So we'll work collectively to cultivate in New Hampshire students both civic understanding and a desire to participate in civic action. So why don't we get started with our first speaker. He is UNH law professor John Grevy, and he'll start us out with a overview of the U.S. Constitution. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, am, uh, I, I am very, very pleased to be here. As Joe said, I'm teaching presently in law school, but um, began my career as a high school Latin teacher. Um, and uh, I have viewed my career as one long, uh, since then, as one long interim until I get back into high school teaching, um, which I, I, I really look forward uh, to doing uh, someday. Um, I have about 40 minutes to do an overview of the Constitution, um, or at least the Constitution that was ratified initially before the Bill of Rights uh, were added. So I'll try to pitch this at the appropriate level of generality. I'm going to spend most of my time giving you, you know, sort of the 35,000 foot historical overview to place the original document in political context. Um, but because I don't know, you know, how much you know, um, I also want to leave some time for questions, which um, hopefully I can answer, or certainly among uh, uh, the people that are here today, um, um, we, can, we can hopefully answer for you. So um, let me start by saying that the period between 1776, um, uh, essentially the, the beginning of the revolution, 1775, 1776, and 1787 uh, was along most of the traditionally applied metrics, um, a su very successful one in American history. Um, the nation had secured independence from the most powerful empire in the world. Um, many Americans were prospering. Um, and friendship treaties were in place that, at least for the time being, uh, seemingly would ameliorate the principal defect of the government under the Articles of Confederation, our first constitution, uh, which was in effect in the 1780s. And that was, um, the, the, um, uh, the absence of uh, an ability to provide uh, adequate national defense. But at least to many uh, who were uh, political leaders at the time and who had conceived of the United States as, as something more, as a noble experiment in reaching the elusive, appropriate balance of power uh, between governmental authority and individual liberty, uh, the period seemed to be a huge failure. Um, the founders, uh, le leading into that period, the development of political thought during the 18th century um, had initially led those we call the founders, the political leaders of the time, uh, to conclude that um, uh, only small republics, only in small republics, uh, could virtuous government be delivered. Okay. Um, it could public virtue be achieved? Uh, but this public virtue uh, seemed to be lacking uh, within the small republics known as the states. Uh, for example, um, the Continental Congress and the states uh, intentionally fostered inflation by issuing unsecured paper money uh, to pay off their debts. Okay? The value of this money, of course, uh, depreciated very rapidly once it was understood what was happening. This, of course, led creditors to, to lose faith in these legislative bodies. Um, also, during this era, uh, the states were engaged in uh, economic uh, warfare with one another. Okay? Um, they also uh, were passing measures that uh, struck many who were in leadership positions um, as taking the country on the road to disaster. I'll just focus, give you an example of a couple statutes from the state of New York, uh, which exemplify 
uh, the sorts of statutes that were in place really throughout the country. Uh, in 1779, New York had uh, uh, enacted a Confiscation Act uh, that confiscated property from those who had been loyal uh, to Great Britain during the Revolution. Um, in 1781, it enacted a Citation Act, which stayed the execution of debts that were owed to loyalists and also allowed those debts to be repaid in devalued paper currency. Um, there was the Trespass Act of 1783, which permitted those who had been patriots uh, and whose premises had been occupied during the Revolution uh, to sue loyalists for damages. And uh, those lawsuits uh, were um, set up to proceed in such a way that, that no due process, uh, nothing even approaching uh, what we would regard as due process. Uh, was afforded to the loyalists. So anyway, these examples from New York and from uh, and, and similar examples from other states um, started uh, the political leaders of this era, who were also intellectual leaders, as you know, uh, to start thinking that that man lacked the virtue necessary for the proper functioning of democracy, even in small republics. Uh, this is the licentiousness, right? This this absence of virtue that is all over the. Uh, the, the, you know, the documentary evidence uh, of this time. Um, in particular, the founders became concerned that factions um, discussed uh, by, among others, David Hume, uh, were coming to dominate uh, these small republics, precisely because of the lack of public virtue. Now, during the same era, there were nationalist constituencies within the United States. Um, in particular, those who had emigrated from particularly repressive foreign regimes, um, those who lived in areas that were particularly vulnerable to invasion by foreign powers, okay, and uh, the veterans of the revolution itself. Um, many of these individuals saw themselves first and foremost as citizens of the United States, okay, and this, these groups tended to favor uh, strengthening the national government. Um, but prior to an event that you um, are probably all aware of, known as Shays' Rebellion, these nationalist constituencies ha had not galvanized. Uh, Shays' Rebellion, uh, a revolt by farmers in western Massachusetts, which protested the seemingly stable Commonwealth's uh, refusal to reform the court system and uh, afford uh, relief to debtors, uh, provided nationalists with uh, an important psychological trigger. Uh, for it, con it convinced many people throughout the country that anarchy and revolution were just around the corner if uh, the government in existence at the time, which I'll talk about in just a minute, the government under the Articles of Confederation, uh, were not uh, amended um, and national institutions were not strengthened. Now, the intentions and actions of the rebels during Shays' Rebellion uh, were exaggerated in the media but again, the, 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 the rebellion had the effect of galvanizing nationalist constituencies into the political forces that eventually led to the calling of the convention uh, in Philadelphia in the summer of, of 1787. <clears throat> okay, now during this time of disillusionment, um, three important ideas uh, really sort of came to the fore. Uh, among the, the leaders and, and, again, the intellectual leaders of the time. Uh, these are the ideas that are, of course, famous from James Madison's Federalist Number 10 and Federalist Number 51, okay? Uh, the first idea is that democratic government needs to be deliberative. It needs to be structured in such a way so that it is led by the best and the brightest, okay? There need to be decision-making layers to democracy. Democracy, in other words, can only function if it is a representative democracy. Okay, so that's the first important idea. Second one, okay, and this is the innovation in particular of Federalist Number 10. Republics need to be enlarged ra uh, so as to um, be able to resist domination by faction. Okay, this is a new idea. Again, before the lesson was that smaller was better. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the idea of separation of powers. Separation of powers along two different metrics. Horizontal separation of powers into different branches of government uh, that would have overlapping powers that would uh, keep each, uh, each you know, uh, the, the other two branches in check. And then this idea of a distribution of power uh, vertically between the federal government and the states. Okay, so these all become uh, important ideas. Now, in addition to these problems that I've already mentioned, uh, there was also the problem of sovereignty. Um, for the states had not worked out for themselves how sovereignty had passed to the new governmental institutions in the states 
uh, after the revolution. Uh, there were all sorts of different approaches and ideas. Uh, for example, Rhode Island and Connecticut made no real changes to their pre-revolution constitutions other than to take out, to eliminate references to the crown. Um, New Hampshire and Massachusetts uh, rejected attempts by sitting legislatures to constitute new state governments, and they called for constitutional conventions. Uh, now notice what's implicit in that, okay, this idea that sovereignty lies in the people, okay, and it emanates from the ground up. Right? The, the, the innovation worked eventually by our national constitution. And then other states took the position that they simply retained their prior sovereignty uh, you know, within the state, but that they were within a state of nature, as they called it, vis-a-vis -vis the other states. So uh, Virginia took advantage of this conception to say that within the state of Virginia, prior sovereignty and, and, the, uh, the, and, the, and the legitimacy of uh, pre-existing institutions was retained, uh, but that the dissolution of the prior national order um, allowed it to reconsider and revisit, for example, debts owed by Virginians to those who lived outside. Uh, that commonwealth. Okay. So the, the takeaway point here is that the, the fact that there was no consensus among the states as to the nature of their sovereignty uh, or how, if at all, such sovereignty survived the revolution, that was another reason for uh, coming together nationally uh, to talk about this issue. So and, a, a, as you understand, I'm sure, the Constitution is best understood in the context of these historical developments. Okay. And, um, a timeline is, is very, very helpful to keep in mind. 1776, of course, the Declaration of Independence. Now, that's never been seen as binding legal authority, but its rhetoric and its complaints about British rule foreshadow the protections of individual rights and distributions of power that are ultimately written into the Constitution. Um, 1781, the revolution ends. It takes two years, of course, to sign the Treaty of Paris. That was not signed until 1783. Um, and then the Articles of Confederation, uh, become, are ratified as the nation's first constitution. And then the five-year period ensues, uh, the era of the Articles of Confederation. All right. Now, the Articles stated that each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence, and every power, jurisdiction, and right, which is not by this confederation expressly delegated to the United States in Congress assembled. Okay. So that's the basic idea. Uh, under the Articles of Confederation. So under the Articles, there was a confederated Congress in which each state had a vote, and the representatives okay, who, who served at the, at the pleasure of state governments functioned more like ambassadors uh, from their states than as national leaders. All right? uh, the analogy is frequently drawn to the United Nations today. Uh, Congress had the power to wage war, to coin money, to establish post offices, um, and to deal with the Native Americans. Uh, basically, the powers conferred on the Confederated Congress were the non-controversial powers previously held by the Crown and Parliament uh, during colonial days. Importantly, however, there was no federal executive, there was no federal judiciary, there was no power to tax, and there was no power to regulate interstate and foreign commerce. Okay? At bottom, there was no power to regulate individuals directly. Um, and this led to problems, much like the problems that the United Nations face. Um, it, it, it made the, the, um, uh, the, the uh, Confederated Congress unable to deal with some of the principal problems of the day. Um, the, facts, the fact, as mentioned before, that the states tended to discriminate uh, against goods made and services provided uh, by people of other states. In other words, they uh, engaged in mercantilist or protectionist legislation. Uh, the fact that individual property rights were widely seen uh, to be insufficiently protected by state legislatures. Um, and then, most basically, the fact that Congress lacked the power to con ensure compliance by the states with the laws that it adopted. So, all right, so as you know, from May 25th, 1787 through September 17th, 1787, a constitutional convention that was originally called to amend the Articles of Confederation following the failure of a uh, similar initiative in the summer of uh, 1786 that was undertaken in Annapolis, Maryland, um, was held. All right. Uh, one interesting question um, is, was this convention and was the product of this convention indeed lawful? Uh, the mandate was to amend the Articles of Confederation. 
And the Articles of Confederation explicitly said that amendments were to be unanimous. And yet the document that emerged from Philadelphia that summer um, made itself efficacious upon ratification uh, by nine states. So some have questioned the constitutionality of the Constitution, if you will. So um, in any event, um, oversimplifying a little, two competing plans um, came to the fore at the convention in that summer. There was the Virginia plan, which contemplated a strong national government with proportional re representation and the ability to regulate individuals directly. Uh, this plan was favored by large states, okay? It was structured, the, the, the structure that was contemplated would work to the favor of uh, the most populous states. Uh, uh, Virginia was the most populous state at the time. Uh, then there was the New Jersey plan, okay, which featured a unicameral, a one-house legislature, which was more democratic, more likely to be influenced by faction, okay, in the, in the views of its critics. Um, equal representation of each state, uh, and then a Supreme Court as the only federal court. Uh, the famous Connecticut Compromise ensued, under which there would be a bicameral legislature uh, featuring a Senate with equal representation of the states, two senators from each state, um, and a House with uh, proportional legislation, um, uh, representation. I'm sorry. Now, of course, during the ratification process, there was lots of opposition uh, from those who called themselves the anti-federalists. Um, and who would largely go on to comprise uh, the Republican Party, uh, the party of Jefferson that would emerge as political parties emerged uh, upon the founding of the nation. Now to overcome this opposition, particularly in New York, uh, a crucial state, and to convince the New York ratifying convention to ratify the new constitution, uh, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison and John Jay um, wrote 85 essays um, that contained what remain to, uh, down to today, influential arguments in favor of ratification of the new document. Okay, these essays would of course become known as the Federalist Papers. Okay, a couple of other interesting historical facts from the time. Massachusetts was also a pivotal state uh, in the ratification process. Um, and John Hancock was governor of Massachusetts and he was a, uh, an anti-federalist. Um, so the Federalists made an agreement with John Hancock that they would not oppose him in the upcoming gubernatorial race. Um, and would propose him for vice president in the contemplated national election, should the Constitution be ratified, if he were to um, not uh, obstruct ratification, okay? I mean, the deal was to work for ratification, but I think the hope was that he wouldn't bring his considerable influence to bear uh, to, to derail it in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, as perhaps you all know, uh, New Hampshire was the ninth state to ratify, so when New Hampshire ratified in June 1788, uh, up in Concord, the Constitution, uh, according to its own terms, uh, became effective. Uh, effective. So, um, at this point, I, what I'd like to do is just walk you through the Constitution that was originally ratified. Does everyone have a copy? I hope you all picked up copies of the Constitution. Uh, again, I'll be just staying at the sort of 35,000 foot level here and just take you through and just note a couple of interesting things about the Constitution. Of course, the, the, the preamble um, starts with the famous words, we the people. Uh, this communicates uh, textually uh, this new idea that sovereignty is not a top-down thing, okay? That, you know, this, there's no divine right of kings or anything like that in this country. We the people. We the people are constituting ourselves. Um, now, again, uh, uh, there were written constitutions in the states that preceded uh, this national constitution, but the idea of written constitutions were, were, was a still a pretty new one at the time. Um, there was such a thing known as the English Constitution. If you said the English Constitution uh, to people alive at the time, they, that would have meaning to them, but it was not a written document. It was simply reference to the form of government, that which was constituted in England, okay? Parliament uh, with the crown. So anyway, um, Article One, Article One, the longest, the most detailed uh, of the seven articles that emerged from Philadelphia. Article One uh, creates and specifies the powers of the new Congress and towards the end um, contains just a few prohibitions on state power. Um, I, I, I'm gonna read the Article One, Section One, because I want to contrast the first few words of it with the first few words of Article Two in a moment. Article One, Section One says, all legislative powers herein granted 
shall be vested in a Congress of the United States which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. All legislative powers herein granted. Uh, this is the idea of enumeration. These listed powers are the powers that Congress has. All right, and what, do we, what negative inference do we draw from that? If it's not listed here, Congress does not have the power. Um, section two creates the House of Representatives um, and, um, and discusses related matters. Section three uh, creates and, and discusses the Senate, talks about qualifications for senators, et cetera. Um, section four um, covers elections. Uh, section five organizes Congress, um, provides rules of proceeding in Congress. Um, uh, section six talks about compensation and privileges. Section seven uh, talks about bills and revolutions, and in particular revenue bills, how revenue bills are to originate. And then um, we get to section eight, okay, which is, of course, the section of Article I that has been most uh, frequently uh, the subject of controversy, at least in court cases. Um, uh, section eight, clause one, contains the, um, uh, the taxing and spending power. Um, section, uh, section eight, clause two, uh, authorizes Congress to borrow money, and then section eight, clause three, is the, um, uh, gives Congress the power to regulate interstate and foreign commerce and the commerce with Native Americans, all right? The, the, um, the, the provision of the Constitution that is most frequently at issue in, uh, in federalism cases. Um, and in all, there are 18, under Section 8, there are uh, 18 different clauses that conclude with um, uh, Section 8, Clause 18, the necessary and proper clause to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all the other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States, all right? also known as the elastic clause, uh, a little bit of a boost, um, a realistic tag on that says we recognize that we've listed a lot of specific things. Um, we can't list everything that might be an appropriate means for effectuating these various ends. All right, so, and um, uh, we go on from there. Again, as I mentioned, um, in Section 10, uh, we have uh, a list of certain powers that are denied to the states. And, and these are relatively few. Uh, so the states essentially, under this Constitution, retain um, a, the, the great bulk of the sovereign powers that they had uh, prior to adoption of this Constitution. Um, Article 2 um, creates, of course, the national executive. Now, contrast the language um, that, that I just read to you with the language that begins uh, uh, Article 2, Section 1, okay? The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America, all right? Now, the difference in the way Article 1, Section 1, and uh, Article 2, Section 1 are worded led to uh, a very famous and one of our uh, uh, initial early disputes about constitutional meaning between uh, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, uh, uh, former allies in urging ratification. Um, the, the fact that Article I starts with the words, the powers herein listed, okay, basically, or words to that effect, and the fact that Article II presupposes something called the executive power um, uh, led Hamilton to say that Article II should not be construed as an enumeration of the only powers that the President of the United States would have. Madison said, wait, wait, no, we have a, a government of limited powers if in fact there are implied executive powers, okay, executive powers that, pr that, that exist outside the text of the Constitution that would defeat the whole idea of enumerating power in this Constitution. Well, it's an argument that I think history would suggest that Alexander Hamilton uh, has won, all right? So uh, just interesting little textual contrast. Um, Article three uh, of the Constitution uh, creates the Supreme Court, uh, specifies the jurisdiction uh, of the Supreme Court, um, and along with Article I, um, recognizes Congress's power uh, to create such inferior federal courts as it might choose to create. Um, and that's a power that Congress exercised right away um, in the Judiciary Act of 1789, and there have been, of course, lower federal courts in existence since that time. But the only constitutionally necessary federal court is the United States Supreme Court. Would have been perfectly constitutional uh, to just simply have the state courts handle all uh, 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 litigation uh, in the nation and the, have the Supreme Court 
sit in uh, uh, with, with, with some very, very limited um, uh, original jurisdiction set aside, but the Supreme Court basically sitting as an appellate court to review state court judgments. Um, article 4 of the Constitution, um, very, very important article that, that, that does not, uh, I don't believe, receive the attention that it deserves. This is sort of the play nice article. Uh, this is the article uh, designed to deal with the problems of, this, of the states not re respecting one another and not respecting um, citizens of the United States from other states. It contains the Privileges and Immunities Clause, which says that the privileges and immunities of citizenship, okay, okay, not listed in this document, by the way, but presumed to exist or, or acknowledged to exist, um, should not be denied by any state to a citizen of another state. Uh, also, the Full Faith and Credit Clause, uh, which directs the states, ordinarily at least, uh, to respect the legislative acts and judgments uh, of the courts of other states. Uh, Congress is, however, given the power to legislate in that area, <coughs> and um, uh, that, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the Defense of Marriage Act case, uh, that's before the Supreme Court, okay. Um, part of the justification for that statute is, is rooted in Article Four of the Constitution, this, this um, idea that the states need not respect um, uh, same-sex marriages performed in other states. That runs counter to the usual presumption that states would recognize marriages from other states. Uh, so Congress is given the power to override the presumption okay, that full faith and credit would be provided. Uh, Article 5 just provides for uh, two different ways for the Constitution to be amended okay, um, uh, with um, you know, super majorities required. Okay, in order to even get an amendment out circulating in the process, you need uh, two-thirds in both houses of Congress. And then, of course, ratification requires uh, ratification by three-fourths of the states. Um, Article 6, um, very important provision of Article 6, the Supremacy Clause, making clear that federal law is supreme to state law. So long as federal law is constitutional, it is the supreme law of the land, okay? And that includes the Constitution itself, federal treaties, uh, federal legislation enacted by Congress, um, and then, as our tradition uh, evolves, uh, uh, court decisions um, by, uh, particularly, the Supreme Court interpreting federal law. Okay, those override decisions by uh, both state courts and um, state political authorities. All right, and then Article 7, as we mentioned before, says that the Constitution will become effective upon ratification of the Ninth State, um, and that happened in June of 1788 uh, here in New Hampshire. All right, um, since, uh, since 17, uh, uh, 88, when the Constitution was ratified, the, it, it has been amended 17 more times, uh, and uh, another speaker is going to talk to you, a couple other speakers are going to talk to you about uh, um, the amendments, and in particularly focusing on uh, particularly important amendments which um, were made following the Civil War. Um, I think I'll stop now, um, just to leave some time, f again, for questions. Um, and I'm happy to take those questions, and, and if they are more appropriately directed to one of my colleagues, I may look for help as well. So, um, uh, does anyone have any questions? Sure, sir. Okay, you, so you hear you mean in the in the press in 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 everyday conversation. I, there are there were different ideas about what this thing known as republicanism was. Okay, there were different ideas, particularly in the North and the South. Um, but you know, backing off of those disagreements, I think uh, the, at a, at a somewhat higher level of generality, the idea of, of a, a republic is a representative democracy. All right, so. Um, you know, we, the purest form of democracy we have, of course, throughout New Hampshire, right? The town hall meetings, okay? People come out, we, we raise our hands, we vote, um, and the result of that vote um, can change town law or, or implements town law each year. Um, representative democracy would mean that we would hand our vote to proxies, right? So we'd go up 
um, and, and we'd elect people who would then represent us and who ordinarily should follow the will of the people, but you know they have the right to cast the vote as they see, and then we, of course, have the right to recall them. That, that's true, and I think future speakers will be talking about that comes from the amendment process, right? That wasn't part of the original document. Now, I'm not talking about states. Right. Here. The states at that time did have a, a vote. They could have Democrats and That's right. There is a clause in the original Constitution um, that guarantees to each state a Republican form of government. Um, uh, that's a clause that's never, that's always been treated as, we call it, non-justiciable. Um, claims have been raised under it, but the court has never uh, adjudicated, at least so far as I know, never adjudicated anything. It's held that that's a non-justiciable non clause of the Constitution and that um, if there were ever a question, it needs to be uh, directed to the political uh, parties. But you, no, your, your statement is correct, sir. Yes? Well, th th I mean, I think they, I, this is the question of who has the final authority uh, to decide what federal law is. Um, and that was uh, one of the, you know, that was not explicitly uh, addressed in the Constitution. That's, of course, why we study Marbury versus Madison, um, because the Supreme Court, uh, through indirection, uh, grabbed that, that power for itself in that decision or asserted that power, didn't, uh, um, but in any event, I mean, I think the argument there was it was not uh, disagreeing that federal law is supreme to state law in situations where there's a conflict between the two. This is the idea of preemption. Uh, but rather the question was who should have the uh, final authority, who should have the ability to say what federal law is and whether indeed there is a conflict. And, um, uh, you know, one of the most aggressive positions advanced historically has been uh, that the states, as co-equal sovereigns, um, have the right um, either, you know, and it's been, it's been asserted by political leaders in the states, it's been asserted also by, um, uh, by the courts in the states, uh, that they have a co-equal right to interpret for themselves what federal law is. Um, that's the idea. That's, of course, the, the, the disagreement. Um, and, and, of course, what the, you know, un the, 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 uh, um, the elephant in the room was slavery. Um, of course, and, and that, was, um, that was a disagreement that uh, needed to be worked out, um, unfortunately, uh, uh, on the battlefields of the Civil War. Uh, oh, sure, yeah, if you could, can you, yeah, can, and can, yeah. No, that's a good point, thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Dave Alcox from Milford, New Hampshire. I, I was just adding that um, a, a modern day example, if I'm, you know, maybe it's not, but would be Colorado's uh, drug laws where um, the, the state of Colorado chooses not to follow the federal law um, and, and, the federal government has chose not to really enforce. I mean, President Obama has said repeatedly he doesn't want to send DEA officers to Colorado. So when you say who has the ultimate authority, you know, where does it reside? I, I totally agree that it, it does reside in the Constitution, Article 6, but I also see where states will choose not to enforce if, if, if they choose not to. And, I mean, signing statements with the president as well, you know, federal law will come down and, you know, the president can sit there and say, I ch you know, I, 
is uh, although I'm signing this, I'm not going to enforce it. Yeah, I mean, there certainly is is all sorts of play in the joints, and our history is a history of the states. You know, the the, the, the cliche is the laboratories of democracy, um, and you know, the, the, you, you use the example of the drug laws uh, in Colorado. Of course, there's the um, you know the assisted suicide laws, um, the case that went to the Supreme Court. Um, several years ago about, and, you know, but, but the, the fundamental point is that if there is a conflict between federal and state law, and if federal authorities choose to assert uh, and enforce federal law, and if that federal law is constitutional, and, and if it's challenged in court, ultimately um, that's the judgment that prevails. Uh, at least that's been the understanding since, um, I w I, it overstates it to say since Marbury versus Madison, but that's of course the most famous uh, articulation. Uh, of that idea. Um, there's, there was somebody right behind you. Yep. Uh, my name is Julia Fimmel. Um, do you think it's safe to say then federal law trumping reserve powers such as, you know, the case in Loving versus Virginia, which is being touted as a, as a marriage law that's now, you know, being adopted by same-sex marriage um, proponents and such. In some regard then federal power Trump state power, but ultimately the states can still sort of do what they want. So it's a conundrum. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, we're saying that, it, that federal power trumps state power, and you, you see that in countless Supreme Court cases that they take to the national level, where like in Loving versus Virginia, the state is shot down. But S Loving Does versus it? Virginia, for people who don't know, was, the, was a Supreme Court case from 1967 which struck down Virginia's anti-miscegenation law, which made it a crime for people of different races to marry. And, yeah, then and the Supreme Court struck that down, though. And so, I mean, in regard to that, in, in, you know, he was just saying, like, um, President Clinton is not, uh, President, sorry, Obama is not, a <laughs> is not acknowledging, you know, drug laws in, in um, Colorado. But at the same time, there's countless examples like Loving versus Virginia, where the federal government said, whoa, hold on, to reserve powers. So it, in, a, in a sense, explaining this to kids that I have done in the past, there's this great conundrum of who really has the power. And do the states have as much power as they actually think they have mm -hmm. because of that clause, because of federal power ultimately is the be-all, end-all? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I take your point, and, I, and that, yes, I mean, ultimately, if federal authorities choose to um, assert the supremacy of federal law, um, and, you know, it, and it goes through the process uh, of becoming final, if it's a justiciable issue and it makes its way into the courts, and the Supreme Court rules that federal law is X and, uh, you know, nullifies state law, that controls. So um, that's absolutely, that's, that's correct. I think we have about five more minutes in that time. Yep. Oh, right here. You can just. <laughs> Hi, I was um, wondering, it seems as though our Constitution is founded on this great compromise between the, the two plans, and we have a situation that's developed, in my lifetime anyways, where compromise seems to be undervalued in our current political discourse. Um, can you just comment on that and see if that is is there a way, or am I just completely mistaken, that, that compromise was sort of a founding principle of our way of government? Well, it, it, I mean, the Constitution would not have come into being, you're right, without compromise. Um, and, you know, um, in many, you know, in many, many respects, the Constitution, I, you know, I might have pointed out, if I had a little more time, you know, if we wanted to go into a little more detail, the Constitution can be very, very specific, right? It can be, uh, it can be very, very clear so that there's really no doubt. Um, you know, you have to be 25 years old uh, and have been a citizen for seven years to serve in the House of Representatives. And then in areas where uh, values diverge, um, the, the language uh, tends to be more general. And that's, um, uh, it, it, you know, that's sort of an agreement to say this is what we can agree on now. Okay, we can agree that due process of law uh, is, is due. Uh, to people within the United States. Uh, we are going to bitterly disagree uh, about what due process of law means, um, but we'll have to work that out over time. Um, you know, I, I, there have been other periods in American history, uh, uh, which, uh, I mean, I think the period leading up to the Civil War, um, you know, uh, we, we always, you know, we have a tendency to think that our period is, is the worst, um, and it's not in any way to disagree with you that, that there are all sorts of troubling 
uh, aspects uh, to the way we're functioning as a, as a polity right now. Um, but um, that's been a pretty, that's been with us uh, since the beginning. There was no golden age of consensus. Um, you know, I mean, again, ha um, Hamilton and Madison, uh, joint authors of the Federalist Papers and very, very quickly become uh, bitter political enemies with very, very different conceptions of how this document is to be implemented actually as a charter of an actual working government. <laughs> there, the, the court has developed um, a, a doctrine, a series of doctrines known as the justiciability doctrines um, that make it nearly impossible for citizens through lawsuits, not impossible, but nearly impossible for citizens through lawsuits uh, to object to the discretionary non-enforcement of law. Um, so, um, my answer to your question is what, or how the Constitution answers your question is through the political process. Um, we elect at the next election uh, people who will uh, take seriously um, and enforce the laws that you would like th to see enforced. You would like to see a, a different priorities. You vote for somebody who uh, persuades you that they share your priorities. That's the answer. That's the answer in the document. Okay. I'm having trouble seeing the clock. I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask a question, kind of piggybacking to. Sure. I just wanted to ask a question, sort of piggybacking to the first one about uh, democracy versus Republican. I think it hits on the principal question you just asked mm -hmm. and connects with what Joe was saying about the overall civic apathy. It does seem, e even though we pledge allegiance to the Republic and, and all that, that uh, we talk more about a democracy. And I'm wondering if you think that's sort of a deliberate or even maybe subconscious um, sort of thing because it's harder to uphold w the virtue that you were describing is inherent in what a republic is. And just as a people, it's harder to get our kind of minds and hearts around what a republic requires of us. Mm. So, so you're saying as a rhetorical matter, you know, why do we keep, d maybe perhaps the reason we default to mm -hmm. talking about ourselves in terms of democracy, which was, was of course, not always a, a good word, um, 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 is, is the very is the notion that republicanism it, there was first of all there was there was never really a consensus on what republicanism meant you know when, when we get it, when you get into the details of that um, it, yeah, that that sounds that sounds plausible to me and I think it, when you think of a politician appealing making an appeal to the pe to the people okay it's the people ultimately who elect that representative in a republican form of government all right so um, you're not going to be emphasizing. Uh, your discretion not to follow the will of the people uh, when you're trying to get elected. You're going to be emphasizing uh, your obligation to follow the will of the people. And that is better conveyed, I think, rhetorically through the word democracy than through this word republic, uh, republican. That's just off the top of my head, though. <laughs> so. Hi. Uh, I was interested in the distinction you pointed out between Article 1, Section 1 and Article 2, Section 1. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I want to know is, was that likely just creative language choices by Governor Morris, or was it something that was actually um, mandated in the convention? Is there a record for why they were treated differently? Um, I, I'm going to uh, ask you, Professor Amar, do you know the answer to, to that question? Yes. I, <laughs> It's in print too, so I'll give you page references if you like. I have a, I have a whole, I have two chapters on on that issue. Uh, assuming a uh, a continuum, on one end being a so-called literal interpretation of the Constitution, and on the other end being a more elastic interpretation of the Constitution. Where would you put the present majority of the Supreme Court over, over history? 
uh, you know, in terms of our 200 years. I think that the current majority of the Supreme Court, okay, um, you're talking about, I mean, I'm, you know, this, this, I, you're talking about when, when Justices Scalia and Thomas are in the majority, I take. It's that we still go back and forth between five and four. I mean, I would say that the, the rhetoric of literal language um, is dominant uh, now, okay, uh, in a way that, um, um, well, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's always been there. I mean, you go back to, you know, the, the, the big cases. You see, um, uh, you know, you see textualism um, in, you know, McCullough versus Maryland. You see textualism going all the way back to the founding. It's always been in the toolbox. Um, I do think that uh, in recent decades, um, it, the, 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 uh, the vehemence with which it has been asserted as the only legitimate way uh, to interpret the Constitution. I think that, um, I, I think that message is stronger and louder now than perhaps it has been uh, historically. Hi, I'm uh, interested in the um, connection between the size of the Republic and the danger of factions. And I'm curious as to what the intellectual origins of that idea uh, was to begin with. You know, where did, where did they draw that concept that by expanding the geographic size of the republic, you would prevent those factions from emerging? And then secondly, do you think that's been effective? You know, did they, did they mean by factions uh, something that has been prevented, or do you think the kind of partisan rancor that we do see in uh, today's republic is what they were trying to prevent? Um, that's, uh, that's, that's a huge, yeah, <laughs> a huge two-part question as I'm sort of eyeing the clock here, recognizing we need to move on. Um, I, with apologies, I think I'm going to, to leave that um, for an upcoming speaker, because I think that's 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 a, um, I mean, not so much in specific terms of Federalist Ten, but but the 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 direction to which your your question is pointed, um, I think w we we will probably be processing processing that all day. Um, so if that's okay, I will. Uh, I, I think I will um, invoke the the, the bell <laughs> right now. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, John, so much for a terrific uh, opening session. We've got about uh, uh, 20 more minutes, and uh, we're going to have one more presenter, then we'll uh, take a break. Uh, and the next presenter is Rick Schubert, uh, emeritus professor from Phillips Exeter Academy, and he's going to talk about the Bill of Rights. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> somebody once asked me, uh, or somebody asked me this morning whether I was going to be doing a PowerPoint. And uh, that struck a chord with me because I've had a kind of general revolt uh, against uh, PowerPoint. Uh, and so, and so, uh, but, and once I was at a conference uh, last year, and uh, there was just one speaker after another with endless PowerPoints. And so finally, I, somebody said, Rick, what are your technological requirements for your talk? And I said, uh, how about an overhead projector? <laughs> People were stunned, and they said, well, we're not sure we have such a thing. And, and I said, well, look around in the history department closet, and sure enough, they produced this. Whereupon I, I took a, what do you call those sheets? Trans <laughs> thank you, thank you, transparency. And I traced my hand, and I said, this is powerful pointing. <laughs> and it's, um, what, what I'm speaking with dedicated teachers, informed educators, and there's nothing more humbling um, except perhaps parenting itself. But the best part is that if we listen carefully, we constantly learn from our students. And I've always thought that um, my own educational philosophy, like I'm sure 
for many of you that teaching and student learning is really one and the same. It's a natural synergistic relationship. After all, we as teachers are just slightly overgrown <laughs> students. We endlessly learn. We learn from our colleagues. Um, we learn from our kids. We learn from our learning, from our reading, from writing. Um, but equally, our students, our, particularly our most thoughtful students, are informed by their own natural sense of inquiry and discovery, their own ability to come together with some assessment and analysis, so that they're learning from their peers as well as us, their parents, other influences of the popular culture, which we know can be pervasive and sometimes disruptive of what we're trying to do. But those most thoughtful students aren't content just to absorb knowledge, but they're anxious to share it with others. And I think we can take advantage of that fact as they take advantage of us. Uh, and together, we are simply students and teachers, all one and the same. So my approach this morning <laughs> is to go, as John did, to some of the sources. I love that he whipped out the Constitution and we actually went through it a little bit. Um, all the Ten Amendments are listed right there for you. Uh, I know you have been through it. Um, I, just have, I just have an uh, approach to it with a view to some of the sources. And I, I, in the process, I just want to acknowledge a couple of people out here that have been dear friends for a long time, as, uh, as I spot several of you in the audience. One is Art Pease, who many of you know is not simply a teacher, but he's a teacher of teachers, and um, as well as a teacher of many countless students. The only thing I can say, I was very glad to know that Art, that you retired slightly before I did. <laughs> but, uh, but Art was the first person to introduce me to the power, the learning example, and we the people. And I was very happy to work on different iterations of this with Art, and suddenly became a, a, a judge of the competition myself. But mostly, it was just an ability to absorb material in a different way and learn it through working with our students. And Art's been very active throughout the state of New Hampshire and the social studies uh, uh, conferences and grants that uh, have ennobled us all. And so, Art, I thank you for your inspiration and learning. And Art has been actually very helpful in accumulating a lot of resources for us. Um, and then my dear friend Susan Wallowitz, who uh, Susan not only recently married, but actually just became a grandmother. And Susan has been a constant inspiration to all of us who have worked with her on the task force for uh, civic learning and the insti possible institute uh, because she has had the audacity to feature constitutional values and ideals to fourth graders. So if our fourth graders <laughs> can not only absorb this material but think about it and, uh, and assess it in their own terms and give it back to us in different ways, we, we all are students, ultimately. And Susan, I thank you for that and being a good friend. I was, I was talking to, with uh, Dennis Peralt, who I just met in person, but only to find out last, last evening, but only to find out that we've been intersecting for quite a few years. We just didn't know how close we were in some of our uh, studies of the Civil War. And we got, of course, into a, 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 a little talk about Lincoln and the film Lincoln. Uh, by Mr. Spielberg, and this furthered by the fact that uh, Professor Amar arrived last evening wearing a Lincoln tie, so uh, and promptly engaged in some wonderful anecdotes with uh, Justice Souter that I was privileged to overhear a bit, and uh, and Justice Souter was talking about the poignance, the poignant thoughts, reactions, sadness he had on his first visit to Gettysburg which ironically is the town where I actually grew up in Gettysburg, surrounded by all this. But I was thinking a little bit about Mr. Spielberg. I take it you've all seen the film, if not, of course, if not several times. It's really a quite brilliant portrayal, and I'm gonna leave the rest to Dennis, but the, what so struck me was, if, if you've heard these conversations that he's had with Tony Kushner, the playwright, you can, you, it's archived on in the New York Historical Society uh, website, and you can go on there. And it's a three-part series of conversations with Tony Kushner. 
And Kushner talks with Harold Holzer, vice president of the Metropolitan Museum. It's got 60 books out on Lincoln, I think, at last count, and countless articles. But uh, Holzer asked him, I said, well, now, wasn't this brilliant of you, Mr. Kushner, that you took this material and made it into this wonderful playwright, wonderful script? And Kushner turned around and said, no, it wasn't me. It was Spielberg. He said, I produced a 500-page script describing the last two years of the war from Gettysburg and Vicksburg through to Lincoln's assassination. It was Spielberg who said, no, that's going to take me a 16-hour film to make. I need a point of focus. And it was Spielberg who picked out the five pages in a thousand-page book by Doris Kearns Goodwin, Team of Rivals, and said, the 13th Amendment is our point of focus. And, Spielberg and Kushner said, I had to promptly go back to the drawing boards and come up with another 250-page, 300-page script uh, that would satisfy Mr. Spielberg. Now, I got thinking about that last night because what we need is Spielberg to take on Mr. Madison. Um, you know, I, I, as, as John, I like going to the source on occasion, and I tend to carry around a paperback version of notes of debates in the federal convention. Um, and it's a great thing for students. Uh, Susan, I don't know whether you've tried this on your fourth graders, but uh, <laughs> that may be a little daunting. But you can break this out, any one piece. Like John mentioned uh, the, the, how you were going to cast the executive office. What was going to be the presidential definition? What was going to be the terms of office? And the great thing about the notes on the federal constitution, it's not just what they only came up with, it's all the different alternatives that were discussed in every part. So you can assign students, even in a larger class, you can take students, divide them up in teams, and put them on one part of the Constitution and say, why did they decide what they did? What else had they considered? And it forms n natural kinds of inquiry and discussion to come out of it. And ultimately, summary analysis, and then they can write up their conclusions. So I have found this useful again and again and again. Now the relationship to, uh, to the Bill of Rights is of course that Madison, you know, he was the shortest, the least healthy, if you will, uh, both physically and in stature, um, of all the founding fathers. He didn't have the dash, he didn't have the angular height or length of uh, Mr. Jefferson or Mr. Washington or Mr. Hamilton. What he did have was a huge brain, a huge mind. And though he was suffering from hemorrhoids terribly, so much so that he, he really couldn't ride a horse most of the time, what he did was think. And you know, the great thing I th think about his role at the Constitution, the first act he does is send his entire library of examples of democracy, republics, to Philadelphia. So his library is waiting there for him when he arrives. And then while the convention is going on, while they're deciding things, while he's putting planks on the floor, the Virginia plan for just one, he's also recording the actual proceedings while he's also jumping to the floor to advocate for things that he considers critically important. And he's also tallying the votes. Now, Professor Amar informed me last night that actually he did some editing after the fact because he had this sense that he was writing for all posterity, for history. And history was looking over his shoulder. And he wanted to make sure <laughs> that his words were endured. So he refined them. Well, that's okay. He was just a wordsmith like, like Mr. Lincoln. But um, it was Madison who then argued the case for the new Constitution, as you know, in the Federalist Papers, along with John Jay and Alexander Hamilton, but it's Madison's arguments that resonated again and again, like the question we just heard earlier um, uh, that struck me as right out of Federalist number 10. That is the expansion of the Republic preventing effectively special interests that could not have anticipated the well-financed special interest groups we have today much less perhaps the results of Citizens United, but I'll, I'm going to leave that to Professor Amar and other scholars. It was Madison, though, 
that when the complaint became shrill, that there is no Bill of Rights led by the Anti-Federalists, but amplified by Jefferson. You remember Jefferson was minister in France at this point, but he'd gotten agreement from his good friend and country neighbor in Virginia that Mr. Madison would constantly send him the results of what was happening in the Constitutional Convention. And Jefferson kept imploring him to do something about this, that there must be some definition of the ultimate rights of man ascribed to this Constitution if it was to gain consensus, and particularly to gain Jefferson's own support, which Madison knew was crucial. So what's he do? He said, okay, Mr. Jefferson, I'll come up with a Bill of Rights. Informed by, of course, George Mason of Virginia and others, he began to put down these words. Um, of course, not, not everyone. He came up with 12 amendments which went forward, although the two that are missing there, as Professor Marr has pointed out in his work, have come back to us in, di in different form. So in some sense, Madison even endured on the two amendments that were, which were not ratified at the time. It, it's really fascinating. And then Madison is also overseeing the ratification debates as they proceed through the states. In fact, there's some wonderful pieces. If, that you can, again, it makes very good reading for our students. Our own small state of New Hampshire had vociferous ratification debates in two different places because initially the revolutionary capital was Exeter, where I have been, and you can see the building where the legislature met, and uh, now, of course, office condominiums, I suppose, but nonetheless, there's a plaque right there on the wall. That legislative hall was also surrounded by men with pitchforks and guns when they didn't, muskets, when they didn't think that the, they thought that the uh, legislature in Exeter had become province to the seacoast commercial entity and didn't reflect farmers, particularly on the mortgage issue. So we had our own uh, Shays Rebellion, if you will. Um, but the ratification debate so worried M Madison that it was gonna go down to defeat, the Constitution would go down to defeat in New Hampshire that he actually orchestrated from afar an adjournment, which took all precedent. And he got it adjourned, moved it to the new capital in Concord, and there actually controlled the delegates. Uh, some people feel he actually so obfuscated where it was gonna meet to the anti-federalists. I'm not sure whether that, whether that is true or just a, a bit facetious. But nonetheless, it does seem there was some chicanery there to, to try and control who was finally going to vote on ratification in New Hampshire. And as John pointed out in his point, we became the critical ninth state. So we have a lot to be very proud of in our own history, and it makes it very amenable, I think, to young people. Also, some of the amendments that became our Bill of Rights were anticipated in the New Hampshire ratification and have already been a fundamental part of New Hampshire's own constitution in 1784. So this is another important thing to point to our students, um, including uh, the right to bear arms and some of the other more uh, dramatic provisions. Um, <laughs> what else did I want to mention to you? Um, I could go through the amendments, but I think uh, in the time I have, um, you know what they are, and you can l look them there. I mean, of course, the great hallmark freedoms of, uh, of uh, uh, religion, both in its establishment clause as well as in its uh, freedom of expression clause. Um, but then, of course, the speech, press, uh, the right to assemble, right to redress the government for grievances, all encapsulated in, in the First Amendment. Now, right there is a perfect place to put your students and have them take one part or another of that First Amendment. Break them up again into teams. Let them wrestle with it. What Professor Omar yesterday called wrestling the hard facts to the ground. I love that phrase. I'm gonna borrow that one, Akio, if I may. That um, get students to grapple with the facts as they know them, as we can know them. Knowing we don't know everything. Sometimes one of the interesting things to ask students is, what is it that we don't know that we need to know if we're gonna solve the riddle? behind Amendment 1. Um, 
course, Amendment 2 attracts their attention because it's so dramatic and it's such a recent Supreme Court uh, position on this. Um, yes, <laughs> last night over dinner, I thought I was attending a graduate level seminar on the Constitution with Professor Marr, so much so that I, I started to deflect whether or not I should really appear today. But, <laughs> but, but, uh, but I raced back to, to Exeter and I got there five minutes before the close of, the, of our library and I w walked in and I said, you gotta keep it open five more minutes, gotta do a quick search. And sure enough, I found two of Professor Omar's earlier works there, not the most recent book, but uh, uh, w w one America's Constitution, a biographical approach, which takes us right through the Constitution. And there are a couple points here I just want to read to you. Um, this is on page 315 where he takes the phrase, Congress shall make no law. And he makes the very interesting point that the Bill of Rights is largely a creation of self-denial. Self-denial is a wondrous thing to behold, an intriguing one to explain. In September of 1789, the first Congress voted by the requisite two-thirds of each house to propose 12 constitutional amendments protecting a host of rights and freedoms against the federal encroachment. By the end of 1791, 10 of those 12 had won enough state ratifications to become valid for all intents and purposes. But why, we must ask, we might ask, did federal lawmakers agree to a Bill of Rights that, after all, limited their own power? Well, of course, a lot of it comes out of the debate between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. But isn't that a wonderful question to throw to our students? Why would these august minds and leaders who have fought through the revolution for this right deny themselves the powers knowing that the weakness of the Articles of Confederation had led them to this point. And yet even here they delimited the government and its ability to act upon us. Very powerful. And then uh, quickly on page 329, there's this. More generally, all the provisions of the Bill of Rights might be said to be rights of the people, quote, of the people, unquote, insofar as these rights emerged from a populist process. Modern judges and others seeking to discover and declare unenumerated rights of the people should look for rights that the people themselves have truly embraced in the great mass of our state constitutions, perhaps, or in just widely celebrated li living traditions, or in broadly inclusive political reform movements. In short, judges seeking guidance on the real rights of the people must give due weight to the very sources and sorts of legal populism that helped generate the Bill of Rights itself. Is it any wonder that we continue to debate vociferously <laughs> the meaning of these words. Um, this chapter in his book, this biography of the American Constitution, is called Making Amends. It's a wonderful piece and a perfect introduction, introduction to his much larger volume of the Bill of Rights itself. At this point, I just about gave up, but I, but, <laughs> but I commend it to you. Um, there are a couple of other sources uh, I'm just going to quickly recommend to you um, that I think will help inform you about the, uh, about the Bill of Rights in general, or about the Bill of Rights specifically and the, Bill, and the Constitution as a whole in general. We mentioned we the people. Another one that I don't think has garnered near enough attention is the incredible work of C-SPAN. You know, the, created, the cable channel created by the television networks um, uh, by the brilliant inspiration of Brian Lamb, who I've met on several occasions. And by the way, there's a wonderful teacher's grant uh, that you can obtain just by write to C-SPAN or just Google it, look it up. There is a teacher's grant which will take you to Washington and they give you, they give a seminar on the workings of C-SPAN and it gives you um, access to their digital visual archive. Wonderful stuff. And increasingly, students are creating some of this content. They offer a number of student internships. 
it's open, again, to students from throughout the 50 states. They try and pick one or two from each state. Same thing with the teacher grants, uh, one or two for each state of the union. So their archival work now is immense and constantly being further amplified. So I would uh, highly recommend that, and uh, m many of you find an opportunity there, as I did, and you get a chance to inter interact with their, uh, with their talking heads, uh, who often are, are wonderful scholars in their own right. Um, another wonderful one that Art and I were talking about earlier with uh, Robin, and again, Robin, I want to commend the law-related education programs, uh, the New Hampshire Bar Association, these, they put out all these materials that are there for one reason, to help you, to help us as teachers and educators, to help our students understand better the constitutional values. And one that I absolutely treasure, uh, I never get tired of watching, it's called Never Say Die. The film about the New Hampshire license plate case, which as you know started <laughs> up in arts territory up in uh, Lebanon, Dartmouth, New Hampshire, and before it was through, went all the way to the Supreme Court uh, over the ability to obscure the slogan, uh, live free or die, not because they were radical young students, but because they were a very traditional conservative couple who were very much objected to the states of proclaiming something that they thought was only in the province of God. Well, there's this wonderful film that's been made of it, and if you talk with Robin, you can actually sign up uh, for a DVD of this. Um, it's so accessible to our kids. It's done slightly tongue-in-cheek, um, pointing out, for instance, the endless irony of the fact that live free or die, who is stamping that on our plates but <laughs> gentlemen and women incarcerated in our, in our penitentiaries. Uh, but, in, but it has this wonderful moment. Uh, I've talked often with Jack Middleton, who, who first surfaced this, and then uh, when he w went through the New Hampshire courts, taking it on pro bono, but then when it went up to the su U.S. Supreme Court, largely because of our former governor, Mel Thompson, who was so outraged that anybody was challenging this, insisted on a, on a direct uh, appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, <laughs> in the outcome of all this, uh, there's a provision in federal law that if this is done under uh, pro bono work with, uh, under civil rights, civil liberties cases, you can actually appeal to have the court costs remanded to you. And so he, he got a subsequent court order demanding that New Hampshire pay up. And it wasn't a tremendous amount, but they're, well, New Hampshire, we don't have any, any monies, right? So, so he actually got a brace of federal marshals to go in and take over the hooks at the liquor store <laughs> and could either take the money directly out of the cash tills or in kind with a tractor trailer. <laughs> That's part of the delight of the film, but you must see that for yourself. Um, there's another one called Voices of American Law. For those of you who feel that, uh, or feel strongly as, as I do, that the visual component can often be a way to entice our students. Uh, Voices of American Law is a program put out by the Duke University Law School. And they started interviewing people in current cases that either have the potential on appeal to go up to the Supreme Court level or have done so. And so they actually get the primary source actors uh, involved on video and recording tape. And this is a wonderful source. They just started this an, a few years ago. They've now built up an archive of 35 of these, and it, I think it's $35 a piece. Again, just Google um, uh, Duke University Law School, or you can actually go to voicesatlaw.duke.edu. These are wonderful, and they, they, com they compress them into uh, video video uh, DVDs of 25 minutes. And so there's plenty of time to still discuss the outtakes with your class. And again, then you can bring in all the supportive documents. I'm right there. Thank you, Joe. One other, one other thing I just want to mention. Uh, again, inspired by Susan, I went out to see if there's just a generally book available for younger students, younger than the ones I traditionally teach. Uh, and it was my wife, Karen, who actually found this called our Constitution rocks, we the people. I had not ever seen this before. It's written by a 14-year-old girl, Juliet Turner, informed by a publisher, a Constitutional Rights Foundation, and uh, her mother, as she said, was her, was her inspiration. But what's beautiful is she just talks briefly about 
her own sense of inquiry. Why does the Constitution read this way? What are the principal points of debate? And so in every point of the, of the book, she puts out the bottom line, a simplified, understandable, plain English version of what each section is about, what were they thinking at the time, why should I care about it, breaking it down for student analysis, and then how can I make a difference? And then finally, what has it done for me lately? Um, <laughs> this is a wonderful compilation I learned from this, which only goes to show we do have to pay more attention to our students. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rick. And uh, we're going to take a quick 10-minute uh, break. We're about, uh, what are we, a few minutes over time. So let's start up at 10.30, please. Dennis Peralt from Campbell High School, social studies teacher, uh, calls himself a recovering attorney. I'll let him uh, explain what that means. And uh, Dennis is going to talk with us about the uh, remaining amendments, 13 through the 26th. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, a recovering attorney is somebody who um, practiced law for a while, in my case, 11 years, uh, and then decided to leave the practice um, and do something that uh, he or she thought he might pursue or she might pursue at the end of their career, um, in the middle of their career. Uh, it's a common joke among lawyers um, who leave private practice that we're always recovering. Uh, if you leave private practice and then you go into like state offices or an administrative job, uh, like my, my wife, for instance, is the deputy, count, uh, deputy clerk of court in Rockingham County, you're just a lawyer in denial. Um, I am a high school history teacher, um, and I, I base my presentation today uh, on the idea of how do I attack the amendments that were given to me. Um, I could literally, and, and you could as well, I'm sure, talk about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment for an entire semester. Um, I can't imagine why you wouldn't want to talk about the 16th Amendment as well, which this year we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of. Um, and, and we can look back and say thank you very much uh, to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment in the five years before that uh, that gave us the 16th Amendment, uh, why we needed to pay for that war. Um, it, the difficulty of covering this much material in, in 20 minutes um, is uh, that you want to have less than one minute, uh, essentially, per topic. So I'm just going to get right to it, um, if you don't mind. I, oops. I want to give you some pers Yes, I have a PowerPoint. <laughs> OK. Sorry. Uh, I want to give you some perspective. The 13th through the 27th Amendment were ratified over a period of 127 years, 1865 to 1992. That's unlike. And in comparison to the Bill of Rights, which was ratified over a period of two years, incredibly fast, uh, and the 11th and 12th Amendments, uh, which took a period of 10 years. Uh, so we had a period in American history of uh, 61 years immediately preceding the 13th Amendment where the Constitution and its amendments were stable. Not that they're unstable, uh, but we saw no need for amending them. It's sort of like we had gotten over the uh, original shock of the Constitution uh, and had made some adjustments in the 11th and 12th Amendment uh, and then began to live with it um, only to see uh, that most pernicious element in the Great Compromise uh, render us uh, divided uh, and plunge us into war, and that, that being the compromise on slavery. Okay. Uh, depending on how you classify, if you look at these amendments, um, there are somewhere at least 19 subjects addressed. Um, and I think that it's interesting that the most topics that are covered, the, the most um, 
repeated topics are uh, voting rights in the 15th, the 17th, the 19th, and the 26th Amendments. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, in the process of electing the President of the United States, uh, 20th, 22nd, 23rd, and 25th Amendments. Um, I love talking to my kids about uh, that particular section um, because of the issues about the Electoral College and who becomes the Vice President. And, and um, I am certainly have not read them, but I'm certainly looking forward to uh, reading the books uh, by Professor here um, and seeing the unspoken part or the unwritten part uh, of the Constitution itself. Um, I think perhaps some of us cover that already. Uh, um, this is a, just an overview chart. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, I did know they were going to pass out constitutions today, um, but certainly all of you have one now, um, and you can refer to them. Um, this is them in order and a brief synopsis. I mean, I have a couple of lines, not even, on what they, what they do. Uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here because I want to get to how I gained some traction with this in the classroom. Um, getting K through 12 students, and I do mean K through 12. If we're going to have broad-based civic education in New Hampshire, and we're going to do it right, we're going we're to start at K. We're not going to wait till fourth grade. We're not going to wait till eighth grade, and we certainly cannot wait until high school. We, we have to hit the ground running with these kids. I, I might even put pre-K here, but, um, you know, state doesn't have any regulation over pre-K. So, oops, sorry. Um, getting students in K through 12 to talk about anything other than the first, second, fourth, fifth amendments is pretty tough, okay? They love the First Amendment, right? From the moment they say no, <laughs> terrible twos, what they've done is uh, petitioned the government for the redress of grievances. <laughs> and by the time they're 13, they have perfected freedom of speech, which they think is absolute. <laughs> and Lord knows, with the uh, proliferation of electronic devices, the freedom of their press is certainly unregulated. Um, I don't have a cell phone. My students are amazed by that. I don't text. And the reason is, I'm afraid of what I might get back. I've tried this approach in two different schools, two very different schools. Um, uh, one with a lot of resources and one without a lot of resources. Uh, it's been effective for me. It is in, in no way the only way to do it. I, I'm not saying you all got to go home and try this, okay? Um, I'm just saying this is some of the, one of the ways I gain traction. I like to categorize these amendments. Uh, and I like to, to do it by categorizing them between procedural and substantive. Now, having gone to law school, I understand that procedural and substantive mean different things to lawyers than they do to ninth graders, or fourth graders, or fifth graders. So we have an incredibly satisfying and rich debate about what is procedural and what is substantive. And I think that that pays dividends down the road. Um, and I think if you do it earlier rather than later, um, you see the results of having that uh, debate and that understanding in the classroom. Uh, the second question I'm going to ask them is, what are the patterns? If we categorize and then recategorize and categorize again, what patterns do we see developing in these amendments? And so, this is my, my shot. We can argue all day about whether I have these right or wrong. Um, but this is my substantive procedural approach. Uh, certain amendments are, in my view, substantive. Others are procedural. Um, and you can disagree. You can take this back to your classroom if you want. Um, and you can redo it, OK? Uh, and then I just simply say, okay, kids, because they're all tech savvy. Let's sort them. And if we sort them along procedural and substantive lines, what do we see? What do we see? Well, I think it kind of jumps off the page, but I put it in writing for you anyway. There are twice as many substantive amendments as procedural amendments within this group. What does that pattern tell us? That's the question I ask the kids. That's the reflective assessment 
And it's right from the get-go. You know, write me in your journal. Here's your ticket out of the classroom. What does this reflect? To get out of the classroom today, you've got to answer that question. They don't want to spend any more time with me than they have to. <laughs> the discussion now is open to the student. I, I agree absolutely with Professor, uh, with Richard, that we have a lot to learn from our students. Um, at the same time, we have a lot to teach them as well. And then, what other patterns are there? Uh, kids come up with these incredible recognitions of patterns. Um, and, and then you open it up to discussion for them. And, y and you let them learn about the Constitution. And you let others in the classroom learn about the Constitution by those teaching them. Okay? And you as well learn. Now I want to add more information. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to go back, and I can't stress this enough, I'm going to go back to the language of the amendments. I want my kids to read the Constitution of the United States. I want them to read every single word of it. And so I focus back in on the language. Let's go back in and see what other possible categorizations we may make. And one of those is to say, who's granted the authority to enforce these amendments or these articles, as it says in the Constitution? And if you look, you will see that uh, in the 13th through the 27th Amendments, one of the things that pops off the page to you uh, is something called Congress is vested with the authority to enforce this article by, quote, appropriate legislation, end quote. Of course, they're a little tech savvy, so we sort them. And they begin to jump off the page at us, okay? Uh, abolish slavery, citizenship defined, the 14th Amendment, okay? Universal male suffrage, prohibition, universal female suffrage, electoral college votes for D.C. You can read the list, okay? Uh, and now we begin to say, of course, eight out of the ten instances involving substantive amendments, Congress has retained authority to enforce by appropriate legislation. Why? Why did they need to do that? Jim Oakes, in his book, uh, Freedom National, which is a book I highly recommend if you're interested in the 13th Amendment, uh, and the question of Abraham Lincoln and the question of uh, emancipation policy, uh, ends his book by saying, was freedom enough? It's the last line in the book, question mark. Was freedom enough? And uh, apparently it was not. Uh, and Congress recognized that. Um, we can all read the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments and I think get a good feel for that and we can understand Reconstruction policies and post-Reconstruction American history uh, in that light. Again, what do these patterns tell us? What other patterns did these kids develop, my students? Uh, and what do those patterns mean? By now, um, we have full-fledged chaos in the classroom, right? Um, and chaos is a good thing sometimes. Uh, it means kids are participating. It means that they're in tune. It means that they're in touch. Uh, it means, quite honestly, that uh, I'm doing my job. And hopefully that they're going to go home and talk to mom and dad about it, and mom and dad will look favorably upon that next time that the teacher contract is up for review and <laughs> approval and <laughs> vote positively. Um, something that didn't happen much across the state this, this year, unfortunately. Now I'm going to add even more information, okay? And I'm going right back to the language. I need the language. It's all about the Constitution. It's all about the language. Not about what I think about it. Not about what somebody else wrote about it. I'll do respect to Professor Amir. It's what's there. And what do they see in it? 
So, who do the amendments primarily impact? Hmm. Remember, these kids are all about what's in it for me. So I asked them, what's in it for somebody else? And this is what I get. I get slaves and indentured servants, citizens, citizens, Congress, Congress, U.S. Citizens, oh my God, what's jumping off the page here? I don't know, let's reclassify them. Citizens. The Constitution of the United States mentions the word citizens 22 times. 12 of those times occur before the 14th Amendment. 10 of those times are from the 14th Amendment onward. Do I see a pattern here? Oh, yes, I do. I see an incredible pattern here. And quite honestly, when you do this, or when I do it with my kids, uh, they see it as well. And the pattern that develops is in five out of the eight amendments involving both substantive changes and enforcement authority retained by Congress, the word citizen appears. Why? What is so special about the word citizenship after the 14th Amendment? What did it mean before the 14th Amendment then? We're in a whole different world of inquiry now. So for homework tonight, I want you to tell me the answer to that question. Your ticket back into class tomorrow is to answer that question. So, a lot of kids don't show up the next day. <laughs> <laughs> and my team teacher who's sitting in the back of the audience here, uh, she and I just look at each other and say, well, I'm sure they want to see you, but they don't want to see me. So, um, no, actually, they, they do come. Because if you build it, they will come. What can we conclude? Well, in this process, I, I, my primary goal is for students to read the Constitution. Can't understand it unless you've read it. So, I've got them to read amendments to the Constitution that most kids probably have never read. I dare to venture a lot of adults haven't read. I've got them to discern patterns. Next order level of thinking, right? Let's jump up the Maslow scale. Here we go. All right. They form preliminary conclusions. And I like that. I like that they're thinking and then establishing reasonable hypothesis. Reasonable ones. I mean, you've all had them in your classroom. Okay, give me a hypothesis. You, you just get, get this thing way out of whack, not in tune with what, what you've been doing. So essentially, I ask them to draw a principled, reasonable primary, uh, preliminary conclusions. And then we began to focus on the broader issues. Inevitably, what happens is these kids are games, these guys are game, or children are game oriented, right? And man, this becomes a game for them. And quite honestly, uh, in the classroom, uh, in a heterogeneous mix like we have at our school, um, you can see the little great thinkers, okay? They are trying to come up with something that stumps everybody else. And you can see those who are less inclined uh, to go on to law school or, or to become professors or, or teachers, uh, trying to think of a way that they can come up with a patent that embarrasses me. <laughs> but they're thinking, and I like that. And then finally, all of us are subject to accreditation principles by NEASC and our local school boards and you know, the think tank people come in and tell us, well, you got to differentiate instruction and you should try this and that. And w whether you like that or not, um, it's a fact. And here's an opportunity for the student to choose. Do you want to work alone? Do you want to work together? Do you, how big do you want your group to be? 
subject to my approval, of course. And it provides the opportunity for cooperative learning, individualized learning. You can take the small groups and put them into bigger groups, right? And then you can have reports out, okay? So the, the kid who's kind of out of it that day, having a tough, t tough day and needs a ticket out, might pick up the answer for that ticket out in this small group discussion. Bottom line is that to read, to think about, to discern a pattern is what I'm trying to get my kids to do. And this approach seems to work with me, for me. And I thank you for your attention today. I'm out of time. I'm done for time. Marco Rubio ready uh, with my water. <laughs> at, the, uh, at the correspondence dinner recently, the hashtag was nerd prom. I wonder what it, our hashtag would be today on such a nice day. Uh, this is not a comedy routine, by the way. Um, but it does feel a little intimidating when, uh, to follow up Professor Amir, I actually feel like a garage band after the main act at this summer concert tour. So I want to whiplash you and go in an entirely different direction which is to look at the application of the content piece from earlier today and what it would look like in our classrooms. Okay, my um, background is as a high school teacher and now as a professor of uh, social studies education. I'm the person that tries to bring the research into practice. So, let's begin. Who is it that we're here for today? Of course, selfishly for um, our own edification, but we're here for students and I think that that's really critical and really important for us to remember. So how can we take today and translate this and transform this and bring to the students our goals and objectives for civic education? Let's think about adolescent development to begin with. First off, adolescents can think in ways that I think are limit, that uh, formal school settings somewhat limit. They can think existentially and they can think problematically about things like ethical problems and dilemmas and they can make decisions. And sadly, we're in an environment today where that is uh, lessened because of high stakes testing environments. But we should strive for that with our adolescents. In addition, we should also make sure that they're reminded of their value, not just in terms of as a person, but in terms of uh, their identity development and identity formation. 18 does not end, ad, or adolescence does not end at 18. There is a moratorium phase that can extend as far as age 30. So we need to be aware of affirming and reaffirming the value and the efficacy of, of our youth. And adolescents seek validation, and that's why they associate with peer groups, okay? I set this stage because part of the focus is going to be what can we do in our classrooms, in those formal settings, to promote an environment where students are going to feel some of these things. For you, it needs to be about relevance and it needs to be about authenticity. So we should bring political issues and we should bring civic issues into our classroom. So for those of you who follow Peter Levine and for those of you that don't, I highly recommend it. Here are some staggering uh, elements of where our youth are today. We have about 12 million that are working on college degrees, but a third of our adolescents don't even get a high school diploma. Our youth today commit homicides at half the rate of their parents' generation, but we have nearly 800,000 that are in prisons. Our adolescents today face an obesity epidemic, but they're very aware of nutrition, exercise, and other issues of health. They're incredibly tech savvy, but they have trouble finding jobs in a tech economy. In terms of socioeconomic status, our students today are growing up in a time period of economic inequality that is unparalleled except for 1929. And I didn't even get into any poverty issues, but I will say this, uh, actually, after Brown v. Board, I think this is kind of interesting, too. 
Our school, our, excuse me, our students are in schools that are more segregated today than they were 25 years ago. Okay, so this is the, this is the floor. Now we're going to uplift. Peter Levine says that any comments that lump all young people together are bound to be wrong. If you care about engaging the next generation, I urge you to drop the stereotypes and focus on important differences. Recognize that some young people are remarkably active and responsible leaders. Include them in your work, but also find ways to engage the young people who are left out. And so that's our responsibility as educators. We should be doing good work and we should be modeling civic engagement and we should be bringing students along. And in addition, those that aren't, that feel left out, we should find ways and mediums to bring them along as well. So let me talk a little bit about some concepts. This talk, so to speak, is civic education, youth civic engagement, and the common core. I'm going to run through each concept and then transition into what it would look like in the classroom. So civic education, broadly, is uh, what prepares people of a country, especially the young, to carry out their roles as citizens. Okay, it's future looking. Or as Amy Gutman describes it, the cultivation of virtues, knowledge, and skills for political participation. So we can see in terms of the education piece, its goal is towards that engagement piece. Now, as you might imagine, in our political climate, there are lots of different conceptions of what civic education should look like. And there are competing views. But what we do know is this, that anything that is done in the short term or in one course is not sufficient. And I think that was mentioned by Dennis earlier, that one credit or one three credit course of civics in 11th grade or 12th grade before heading out to college or wherever they're going after uh, secondary or post-secondary um, is not sufficient. And that it needs to happen early and it needs to happen often. And it needs to be sustained and it needs to be integrated and it needs to be intentional. And that is what is necessary. And I think Professor Amar was one that was highlighting some of that in an initiative that he spoke, uh, spoke to earlier. So Joe Kahn um, and, and uh, some, other, um, some other professors uh, have been doing a lot of really good research on um, civic engagement. And what they basically argue is that in terms of civic education, do not depend on whether students take, a, or excuse me, that, that high quality civic education doesn't depend on whether students take a U.S. government course, but it depends on the kind of civic learning opportunity students have in, the, in their civics cl civic classes and elsewhere in the curriculum. So you have a chief responsibility as a, as a teacher in your formal setting to promote some of these things, but you also have an obligation to find partnerships and community assets and resources that can help you take what is learned in a formal setting and apply it. Right now, civics is looking at a new framework that focuses on three different areas or three different categories. Knowledge, skills, and dispositions. It sounds a lot like the NCSS standards and some of the focus that they have in terms of three areas of growth or three areas of opportunity for students. So basically, we're looking at understanding, we're looking at ability, and we're looking at characteristics or outlooks all of which can be facilitated and fostered in positive ways, which I'll get to in a moment. We know that in civic education, there are basically six different ways that we teach youth, we teach adolescents, and that are effective. Three of these are classroom-based, and three of them are extending outside of the community we could do an entire semester on each of these categories. So I'm going to focus on three. This is what you can do in your classroom. Classroom instruction, discussion of uh, current events and controversial issues, and then simulations of democratic processes. We have We the People in the background over there, so I'm going to put some props up for you as well. Um, in terms of classroom instruction, it's about relevance. And two different programs that promote relevant uh, civics-based curriculum to their students is the We the People program and Project Citizen. There are others. These are just exemplars. In terms of discussion of current events and controversial issues, facing history in ourselves and deliberating in a democracy. In terms of civic processes, iCivics, kids voting. In all cases, these are resources that are available online. These are materials, these are curricular resources that you can use 
to mo and modify for your classroom. So you don't have to go take the rest of your afternoon and start from scratch. You can borrow, you can use, you can modify, and you can manipulate these in ways that are going to be beneficial to you and to, more, most importantly, to your students. And a little bit later on, again, when I get to the, the framework for a, for a classroom, I'll show you the integration of some of these materials. So that's the civic ed part. Let me re rewind here. Civic ed is, be these are the best practices of civic ed. These are the things that you can do in your classroom, in your formal setting, and these are things that you should do as the spine of your course. If you want to be an, an effective or an efficacious uh, civic ed instructor, whether it's in history or economics or civics or government or modern social problems or psychology or world cultures, you can use these civic strands through. So in terms of engagement, uh, Peter Levine argues that um, any action that affects legitimately public matters, even if it's selfishly motivated, as long as the actor pays appropriate attention to the consequences of his or her behavior for the underlying political system. That gets a little bit wonky and a little bit philosophical, but it does say essentially that we are civic actors and that we engage with others. An another way of putting it is working to make a difference. And so that is perhaps a goal or perhaps an outcome that you would want to, um, it, I guess, promote to your students and that it's something that happens both in political spectrums and non-political spectrums as well. So in terms of um, civic engagement, we know that there are three top levels of direct action uh, that students do in schools. They do community service, potentially as part of their curriculum. More and more schools are going to that. We know that political discussion is also a best practice for civic engagement. And we know that environmental conservation is one too, which is tied a little bit with the community service piece. So to best develop students' uh, civic engagement, schools need to involve students in direct civic action. So I highlighted three that you can do in your classroom. These are three areas that should be generated from school, but working out in your community. For those students that are civically engaged, a study done by Circle in 2010 looked at categorizing the different groups of, of uh, students in terms of their civic engagement. So we have those that are broadly engaged, some that are political specialists. These are nice, nice, uh, little, uh, nice little taxonomy. Donors, undermobilized talkers, civically alienated. But there's a, fi or there's a distinct line between those that are engaged and those that are not engaged. And that begs the question, how should social studies teachers prepare students to be enlightened and engaged citizens in our democracy? And this isn't a question that we should ask now, necessarily, but it's a question that's going to be the focus of the next session, which is the brainstorm. How should we do this? I've given you some ways. And I'm going to walk you through a couple of other uh, models as well. What about New Hampshire? What about our youth here? In New Hampshire, we have a group called the Millennials. That is who is in our classrooms today. And they are less likely than older respondents to agree that citizens can impact elections and political processes. Might that be a reason for the disengagement? Could be. Might it be a reason why civic education is incredibly important? Because we want active involvement. We want the small d democracy. We want people involved in the processes. So this is disconcerting to me as an educator, to me as an educator of social studies teachers, and to me as somebody who is involved in the civic community, which is part of the reason why I'm here today. So our civic health for the millennials, is concerning. Is this what's happening? I hope not. And I don't think so. So the Common Core, the latest layer of standards that are 
infiltrating classrooms everywhere. They're not content standards. It's not going to tell you what civics you're going to be teaching. Instead, it's going to focus on college readiness or career readiness. And basically three categories, reading, writing, speaking, and listening. But how do you do it? What I find interesting is that other researchers have looked at civic skills and have put them into three broad categories. Communication, not only expressing but understanding facts and opinion, which were part of earlier presentations in terms of its importance. Democratic deliberation and collective decision making. And critical analysis of, of political information. So the people that are saying the civic skills are, that civic skills are necessary, and these are ways of conceptualizing civic skills, and those that are saying broadly here are skills for everybody in terms of college and career readiness, they parallel each other. So what would this look like in practice? This is a shameless uh, <laughs> plug. So I've been, over the last couple of years, developing a, a wiki page where these resources can be found. There are many different links to um, different curricular websites that have lesson plans that are available uh, for download and for use. But also, if you notice, there are lots of topics within that help with differentiation and that promote literacy, different literacy strategies for social studies educators. You're learning to be more of an amalgam of a, of a teacher of all in using social studies content and social studies skills. These aren't the only things that you can do. There are hundreds of books that are written, but it's at least a start. So I'm going to talk about a framework that I use. This is a conceptual framework. We, as teachers, work on a continuum. Really structured, guided, and independent. And we hope that our students reach that independent part so that they can do these things, whatever it is, in terms of knowledge, skills, and uh, dispositions on their own. But along the way, we're going to structure and model how it, what it looks like, work with the content, give them practice with feedback, lots of good feedback and guidance, in hopes that they can demonstrate what they know and what they're able to do. And I think intuitively, as teachers, we know that. Sometimes it's visually a good reminder to see what that framework looks like. So in a, in a unit, for example, there are four different methods that you can use as a, as a learning progression. And each of these will be looked at in a, in a little bit, but they address aspects of the common core. So when you saw that little check on the sheet that said uh, common core ready, we'll get ready, because these are all all the things that you're going to need. This is the panacea. All right, in the last election, young voters indicated five different areas that were of greatest interest or concern. Jobs at unemployment, which should be the case, considering the unemployment numbers for this particular age group, those 18 to 29. The federal deficit, education, abortion, same-sex marriage. Now remember earlier the implications for teachers when working with our youth and adolescents today is to make things relevant. So I'm going to choose this one, same-sex marriage. This is our topic, concept formation through simulation. So a concept formation is a method for looking at essentially vocabulary the really, really important terms or the important concepts that are going to be the theme throughout your lesson, or th excuse me, throughout the units. So for some of you, a Frere model is, is probably the most, uh, or the best analogy. But essentially, a concept formation brings students through establishing three or so attributes that help define the term or define the concept, and then they test that concept and those attributes with not examples and non-examples. So what it is and what it isn't as a way of helping to deepen their understanding of the term and of its application. So again, same-sex marriage, we're going to go 14th Amendment, we're going to look at due process um, and equal protection as potential concepts that you could include. 
Where might you find them? Good stuff on street law. Here's what you're accomplishing according to the Common Core. Vocabulary. Determine the meaning of words and phrases as they are used in a text in specific domains. You did it. You've taken students through a deep understanding of a concept, equal protection. Let's shift outside of that for a second. What about sustainability if you're doing anything with the environment? Or communism? Or socialism? Or democracy? All these terms that are relatively abstract, somewhat ambiguous, nail them down. Make them concrete for the students if they're going to use them in the lesson. So that's the foundation. We start with terms. We go right into inquiry. An inquiry is a process where students generate hypotheses and then test that with evidence. Get them investigating. Get them looking into the issues at hand. So for example, what about these questions? Should same-sex couples receive equal protection under the law? Interesting question. Students would be thrilled to take a look at that in, in depth. Or the other examples as well. Good questions, essential questions, ones that could be open or could be um, a yes-no type of question, a binary question. Depends on what you want and depends on what resources you have. Here's where you can find them. Pro-con, street law, teachingamericanhistory.org, teaching tolerance. Just as an example, again, the resources are there for you. It's, it's about the, the framework that's of value here. So I haven't shown these uh, pages, but this essentially um, is one of the pages in, uh, that highlights the lesson plans for teachingamericanhistory.org and then teaching tolerance as well. They have great search features where you can look by different tags. So in the inquiry, holy cow, this is a boon. In the inquiry, in terms of reading, you're getting students through a, a very specific skill set that are tied to the Common Core, related to meanings, ideas, arguments and support using multiple texts. Add a writing component and suddenly you've got informative and explanatory writing. You're doing inquiry and research, even though the research is actually something that you would provide to students. But again, this is a robust method for you to engage your students and it's Common Core uh, aligned. So I want to take a stop for a second. Did you want, to, want me to go back? Okay. Um, I want to take a stop for a second and I'm going to highlight the last two pieces are discussion oriented uh, methods and simulations of democratic processes. So the inquiry and the concept formation are what would be categorized as best practice classroom instruction. The discussion of controversial issues and current events is the discussion piece and the simulation, obviously the simulation, moot court, mock trial, congressional simulation. Here's what we know. Latest research. This is good stuff too. Best practices. Those teachers that engage their students in the discussion of current events, participate in debates, and participate in simulations do better than other students who don't. But we know that it's not equally distributed. That there are some students that get high quality civic education and some students that don't. One factor is parent income. That affects whether or not a student is going to get high quality best practices, high quality civic ed instruction. We also know that socioeconomic status matters. Students that are in uh, free and reduced lunch programs or free and reduced lunch program eligible receive less high quality or less, yeah, less high quality civic education than those that don't. So we have different qualities of civic education that are applied inequitably. And that definitely needs to change. But the evidence is pretty clear. Those students across the board that receive 
instruction that focuses on more practices that are considered best practices do better on standardized exams like the NAEP test on civics. So it dispels the notion that you have to drill and kill in order to take the standardized test. No, you need to implement best practices in your classroom that promote active learning. So, a civic ed best practice. Discussion. There are basically three types that I try to focus on as a, as a classroom instructor um, in, in pre-service and in-service teaching. The one that I'm going to focus on is a uh, structured academic controversy, but a Socratic, but a Socratic seminar is investigating a, a text in a very deep and rich way. Uh, Professor uh, Amar mentioned, I think it was, uh, the Declaration of Independence, Gettysburg Address, I Have a Dream Speech, Brown versus the Board of Education decision, a couple of Federalist papers, and a sixth that you can only find on Amazon for $12 in paperback. Um, but that is a process that you can go through with your students to deeply investigate a text. A deliberation, on the other hand, is um, providing options and using open space for students to discuss potential options and to come to decisions on those options. The structured academic controversy is a way to look at controversial issues. So in a structured academic controversy, you have students in groups of four. You have side A, which would be, let's say, a pro side, and side B, that's a con side. After an investigative reading, the pro side begins. They make their statement. It's a thesis statement supported by these claims. They do it through speech. The other group can't argue. What they can do is they can ask questions for clarification. And then group B goes, presenting their thesis. We're against it for X reasons, da, da, da. The pro side asks questions for clarification. And then they switch positions. So they're getting students to look at issues from multiple and competing views. They're practicing a democratic deliberation. And in the end, so they go through that process, and in the end, as a group of four, depending on what you want as a teacher, you can have them come to consensus as a group on the issue. Or somebody could say, you know what, despite the fact that the con side had a compelling case, I still think it's the pro side. And here are my reasons why. And so if you were to do this, you could set this up in a graphic organizer, looking at initial impressions, a background reading, the pro side, the con side, and let's say you're using the deliberating in a democracy material. Good stuff. So after that first round, when they switch positions, what you want to do is you want to add a layer from a different set of sources. Because if you just stick to the one source, you end up having students repeat back what they already heard. You want additional information. You want more information so that students can weigh more heavily and more effectively to support their position that they're making a choice on, where they're taking a stand in the end. And again, Deliberating Democracy has some great resources here. It's geared for a structured academic controversy. Pro-con, same thing. The pro-con not only has lots of information, but it has lots of additional resources and texts. So in their uh, pro-con charts where they have listed different um, like abstracts of each side, they link out to PDFs that you could use. So again, the materials are there, as long as you know where to find them. And what does a structured ac academic controversy do? A whole lot. In terms of reading, it accomplishes a lot of the common core standards. In terms of speaking and listening, same thing. So it's a very rich, way, very rigorous way, for your students to engage in civic education. What about a simulation? Uh, the We the People program has the uh, congressional simulation, congressional hearing. There are others, mock trials, town halls, town um, uh, moot court simulations, um, and probably several others that uh, you would include too. And I would throw in role play as well. 
as long as the students are writing their roles and writing the, the script for how they're going to engage in that particular activity. And what do these accomplish? Again, in terms of writing, a lot. It does the body good. Argumentative pieces, and explanatory pieces, in terms of speaking and listening, collaborative pieces, looking at information analysis. So in these four methods, you've basically aligned yourself with the best practices in civic ed, which I think are important, the civic skills that are important, and you're satisfying this next level of standards that you are going to need to align to. And what do we know? We know that taking students through three practices, two practices, basically more than one of those practices, even on standardized tests, they perform better than those that don't. So we go back to this question. How should social studies teachers prepare students to be enlightened and engaged citizens in our democracy? And that's the question that you're going to be tasked with and a few others during the brainstorm session. But we know that high quality civic education must be sustained K through 12. We know that it must be more than just a one shot deal. And we also know that getting students involved in quality classroom instruction, simu excuse me, uh, discussion of controversial issues and current events, and participating in democratic simulations, all of which can happen in formal school settings, are good for your students. They help develop civic knowledge, they help develop civic skills, they help develop civic dispositions, and we hope civic efficacy so that they feel informed and willing and able to participate in our democracy. Thank you so much, Mike, for a, a terrific entree of options for teachers that are interested in promoting uh, civic education and satisfying Common Core requirements. Uh, you know, essentially the Common Core has adopted a, a cognitive science uh, language, and we're all used to content language, and uh, it really doesn't require you to do much new. You just have to adapt your units to your... Uh, uh, to the to the new language and uh, fortunately they're talking about 40 to 50 percent of the new content being nonfiction being assessed in the language arts standards so there seems to be an opening for social studies in an environment where we seem to be discarded but I think um, they're gonna need us and uh, especially if we all get vammed um, we're all in this together so best of luck with that the other thing is that um, you know this Institute is going to serve as a clearinghouse so that uh, Mike's work and uh, all the other materials that uh, have been sh uh, shown today, we're going to place on a website, and so we'll serve as a clearinghouse. Mike just okayed uh, you being able to access his materials. Dennis is willing to share his materials on the uh, 13th to the 27th Amendment. So we're really, and hopefully all of you will contribute as well. So uh, we're going to create a statewide community uh, of, of resources and uh, ideas for the classroom, which transitions nicely to our next section, which is uh, breaking up this group into three uh, groups, elementary, middle, and high school. And uh, we'll have you get into some small groups, and there's a facilitator for each of the uh, groups uh, to talk about uh, possible applications and, uh, and uh, moving forward. So we've got the high school group that's gonna stay in here, and then the middle and elementary groups are going to head down the hallway. And uh, I have the middle school group. Uh, you go past the restrooms, and you're going to turn left. Uh, and it'll be the first room on the right. That's the middle school group. And then the elementary group is the next room down. And so we will do this from uh, now until uh, 
about 2.10, so we've got 25 minutes. Then we'll reconvene here. We'll get your feedback, and, uh, uh, you know, this is a test run. This is our first, uh, first attempt at uh, constitutionally speaking. We want this to meet your needs. So the last uh, 15 minutes before you head out into that uh, 65, 70 degree weather will be to give us some feedback on how we can improve the quality of the programming uh, to better serve your uh, interests and needs. Okay, so high school stays here, uh, middle school uh, uh, down the hallway, turn left, and the first one on the right, second uh, room on the right for elementary.